Jesus, tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. All right, you may be seated. Let's see, did you get that uh, transition there? Good. All right, good job. All right, let me get this... Uh, it out today. Grateful for you being here. Grateful for those that are tuning in this morning. It was a good Sunday school lesson. Looking forward to the next ones and uh, it was interesting hearing what other people think and uh, hear what religious, you know, the religious textbooks of the world have to say about truth. Man, talk about just being in total darkness, man, with these false religions. I need my Bible. All right. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for giving us this book. Thank you, God, for the truth. Thank you for you, and thank you for Jesus, and thank you for uh, just teaching us the truth. And Lord, uh, thank you, God, that um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, I'm grateful that I'm saved. I'm grateful that I have the truth. And Lord, we pray that you'd, uh, your Holy Spirit of truth would speak through me this morning and uh, just uh, speak to the hearts of your people, give them understanding. I pray, God, you'd uh, use this lesson this morning as uh, a little bit of salt to give your people uh, more of a thirst for the scriptures. And I pray you'd help me with getting this information across. And I trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and turn to start out with uh, Luke uh, chapter 3 and uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 and 1 Chronicles chapter 3. All right, now we're on the fifth lesson in the hidden details in the life of David, and I hope you've been learning some things. I've tried to make it a point to uh, put out some information in each lesson, just things I've come across in my Bible reading and studying over the years, and, uh, you know, the things that I'm trying to put across in these lessons are... It's, it's fine to do rehash stuff, but these are there's actually things in each one of these lessons that I've personally never heard taught before. So this is original information. It's not stuff that I've necessarily stolen from other people. Not all of it is, but there's a few things that are original. So, uh, you know, for what it's worth, it may, maybe, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. In one instance, at least, <laughs> I found out that I was wrong about something. So uh, we have one of our online listeners whose name is Sin Distancing Seven Feet, and uh, they asked about David's son Nathan uh, being listed in the genealogy of Christ in Luke 331 because you remember last week I had mentioned that David's baby uh, that died of Bathsheba and Solomon I figured that his his name was baby Nathan based on that verse in uh, 1 Chronicles 3 5 where Nathan comes right before Solomon well I didn't think to look in the New Testament with the genealogy. Didn't, didn't even think about that this time. And in Luke 3 verse 31, look at what it says here. It says, which was the son of Melita, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Okay, so David had a son named Nathan, and that kid Nathan had a son named Mattatha. So therefore, the truth is, <laughs> is that that baby could not have been Nathan. All right, so I uh, taught you last week that that baby was Nathan, and I also taught last week that people need to be able to admit when they're wrong. And uh, so I was wrong. So I was wrong, and I totally missed that reference to Nathan there, so I really do appreciate sin distancing seven feet for pointing that out. Now, uh, personally, I'm more interested in the truth than I am my own theories, okay? It's not about Matt Crane here. And uh, I've said it before, and I've said it again. If somebody can show me from the Bible why one of my theories is wrong, I'll throw my theory out the window. I'm more interested in the truth, okay? And I think if we all, as Christians, had that mentality, I think we'd be a lot farther along in our Bible understanding than we are today. Because a lot of times people have a tendency to just cling to theories and teachings that are demonstrably wrong, but because so-and-so taught it, that's what I'm going to believe. Or because I've always believed it all my life, that's what I'm going to believe. Well, sometimes you're just wrong. And you just need to admit that I'm wrong, this person that taught me was wrong, my religion is wrong, whatever, 
go with what the book says, okay? So uh, I decided, though, I thought, well, okay, so that's not the baby's name. So I thought, well, let's see if the Bible can indicate what the name of the baby was. And in First Chronicles chapter 3, did a little bit more digging, which is good. That's the thing. When you get information that contradicts something that you thought, uh, it causes you to do some more digging. And that's a good thing. And in 1 Chronicles 3.5, if sin distancing seven feet hadn't uh, corrected me, you know, reproof, reproof is simply a correction. Reproofs of instruction. It's not an aggressive thing like a rebuke, but it's just, hey, did you ever consider this? That's a reproof. The reproofs of instruction are the way of life. That's a good thing. And in 1 Chronicles 3, I started, ended up doing a little bit more study, study that I wouldn't have done otherwise if this hadn't been pointed out to me. So I'm grateful for it. 1 Chronicles 3, 5, it says, And these were born unto him, David, in Jerusalem, Shimea, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon, four, of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. All right, now real quick, before I talk about these kids, it says Bathsheba. You say, well, I thought her name was Bathsheba. Okay, it, it's the same person. Just so you know, uh, there are variations in spelling, and that is common in the Bible. Don't let people tell you that it's a Bible contradiction or that this translation is bad. There are, it's, it's normal for, for names in the Bible to be spelled differently in different books at different times. And part of those uh, changes in the name spelling can be due to abbreviations. It can be due to uh, nicknames, which we have today. You know, uh, There can be additional names that are given to a person later after some uh, major event happens in their life. They might take on a certain name you know, after that, that names them after that event. That's Something that could happen, for example, Jacob was his name until he was named Israel later in life. Uh, language translation variations. So, for example, you have Peter in English, Pablo in Spanish, Pierre in French, and Piotr in Russian. But it's all the same name. Okay, So, just because it says Bashua doesn't mean that this is a problem. And then also, you have Amil. And uh, it says she's the daughter of Amiel. Now, that could be her mother, but more than likely, that's another name for Eliam, which is her father that we've seen in other texts. Amiel and Eliam are probably the same person. I'm just pointing all this out, just, you know, if you want to know. But uh, Amiel is, uh, means the people of God. Eliam means the God of the people. All right, so the, the, the terminology of the name is very similar, so more than likely, that's the same guy. All right. Now, when it comes to the kids, uh, 1 Chronicles 3, 5 shows that David and Bathsheba had four kids total. All right. Now, we know that the list is not in chronological order. We know that now. And uh, we know that Solomon was the second child born. OK. David and Solomon's first baby died. The second child born was Solomon. And then after that, there must have been Nathan uh, and then who and then Shobab and and. Shemia, we don't really know if they were born later or who they are exactly. Now, uh, let's see. I want to point something out here. When it comes to the first baby, the one that died, the baby that died, there's only two options you can come up with. The baby that died, either it was never named, like we never have the name of that baby in the scripture. Like we, the, the kid died and then they had four kids later and they're listed here. That might be. The other option is that the baby who died was named either Shobab or Shemia. One of those two. Okay, so we know it's not Solomon. We know it's not Nathan. So it's either Shobab or Shemia. Now think about this. Nathan means gift or given. Solomon means peaceful. Shemia means heard, as in a prayer heard, or famous, renowned, something along those lines. That's the definition of his name. Shobab means apostate or rebellious. Now, which one is not like the rest? <laughs> uh, naming your kid apostate or rebellious is admittedly kind of weird. <laughs> you know, uh, granted, maybe he had a different name and then he just grew up and he was a bad kid. And they said, and, you know, later on, the writers were like, let's name him apostate or rebellious or you got that name later that's always a possibility i doubt it though it sure would be an appropriate name though if david put that title on the little infant's tombstone as a reflection of david's own rebellion and apostasy i find that kind of interesting because apostate means falling away fallen away and david certainly fit the bill of a rebellious apostate during those nine months of, De of uh, bathsheba's pregnancy and so anyway, back to the story of Nathan and David, it's interesting that that little baby 
that, that could be Shobab, uh, the little apostate. You, you say, well, that's mean to name your dead baby apostate or rebellious. Back in those days, sometimes the, the kid was named after an event, kind of like the woman naming her child Ichabod. You know, like, well, what did that little baby do to deserve a name like that? Well, it wasn't his fault. It was just that the ark had been taken, Eli had died, and she names him Ichabod because she's having a bad day. You know, so David could have named this kid Shobab. I thought that was interesting. I never would have seen that if I hadn't been uh, instructed in this way. So, 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let's go ahead and pick up this story here. We're back at the story of Nathan and David, the prophet Nathan and David. And you remember that in that rebuke, uh, Nathan tells a story about a rich man and a poor man, and how the poor man had one little lamb that he loved. That's all he had. He loved this little lamb. But the rich man, you know, he has plenty of sheep, and he has a friend coming to town. And so the rich man, you know, he doesn't want to take of his own flock. So he goes and steals the poor man's sheep, kills the sheep, and feeds the sheep to the to his friend that came over. And uh, David, you know, has a soft spot in his heart for sheep. And so he gets irate when he hear this, hears this. And he says in verse 5, he says, And David's anger was kindled greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. All right, so now notice the consequences of David's sin. Verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. In other words, you laid with someone else's wife, so someone is going to lay with your wives. Uh, payback, equal justice. Verse 12, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And then it says in verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Had, Nathan, had David not responded that way, Nathan might not have responded the way he responded. David says, I have sinned. And then Nathan says, Oh good, I was hoping he would say that. Because you responded that way, and you're repentant, the Lord hath put away thy sin. All right, thou shalt not die. Now, question, why would God do this? How can God do this? Okay, you have to look at God's actions in the Bible from the standpoint of, of legality and, and law. Okay, a legal standpoint, because as the judge of all the earth, God cannot sin or do wrong or break the law. Okay, judges aren't supposed to do that. Otherwise, they're unjust judges. So God cannot break his own law, and yet David manages to escape the death penalty. How is that possible? Well, in the Old Testament, you know, God spoke words that said that an adulterer and a murderer should be put to death. Okay, you have that in the Old Testament law under Moses. But God also spoke words to David that are just as binding as anything written in the law. Because whether God speaks it to Moses or God speaks it to David, they're both perfectly applicable. All right, one's not more important than the other. They're the word of God. All right, so God had made a promise to David years prior. Look at chapter 7. Chapter 7. Now, this is an interesting scenario because David, need, David deserves to die. I mean, man, if anybody deserved the electric chair, David deserves it, and he knows it. And in uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, it says, And when thy days, this is what God's speaking to David, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul. Whom I put away before thee. Now, remember what left Saul specifically? It was the Spirit of God. And God says, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm gonna, you. You and your children, you might mess up, you might some, do some iniquity, but I'm not going to forsake you like I did Saul. Okay? I'm not going to be done with you like I was with him. And this is what's called the sure mercies of David in the Bible. If you've ever heard that term, that's what that's talking about. The sure mercies of David. All right? 
God said that there would be certain, certainly be consequences for sin, and, and there always is. But he would never be completely finished with David like he was with Saul. And that's a very similar thing to what we have as Christians. Christians have the sure mercies of Jesus Christ, if you will. Christians can do all sorts of awful things, but God will never remove His Holy Spirit from you. You will always have that salvation. Okay, So it's kind of a similar thing along the lines with David, kind of along those lines. Now, God is, has, when David does this sin, God is in an interesting pickle, <laughs> if you will. God's made this promise to David, but David has done this thing. And uh, God cannot contradict the Old Testament law, but he won't contradict his promise to David either. So what does he do? Well, ultimately, the way that this works out is the Lord put away David's sin so that David would not have to die. But just because the sin was put away doesn't mean it's cleared. It's kind of like God just said, OK, I'm going to put this on the shelf. I'm going to put it in storage for a little while, but I, I'm going to have to deal with it someday. All right. And David's sin was still on the books. David's sin was still listed on his personal account. It was not cleared. Okay? There's a difference between a thing being forgiven and a thing being cleared. All right? Now, David's sin was set aside, but it would have to be paid for in full someday by someone. Okay? And uh, now hold that thought. David had also sworn. Now, when, when David had said this thing to Nathan about this sheep being killed... David had sworn by the name of God, as the Lord liveth. Okay, that's a big deal. <laughs> he had sworn by the name of God that the rich man should restore fourfold. Right? And uh, he says, he shall also restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Therefore, because David said that and brought the name of God into this situation, <laughs> absolutely, David now has to restore fourfold, which he does. And uh, there are a couple, a couple of interesting things I want to point out here. Now, you've heard some of this stuff, I'm sure. And uh, David has a lot of children. And uh, in the chapters that follow, you read about the chaos in uh, David's family. And a lot of David's kids end up dying. He says, you killed that lamb, so that rich man needs to have four of his lambs killed. All right? David's the rich man. So he's going to have four of his lambs. He said that that poor man treated that lamb like a daughter, like a child. So he's going to have four of his children die because of uh, what he did by killing Uriah. All right? Now, the first kid that dies, I'm just going to write Shobab. Now, I could be wrong about that again, <laughs> but I'm just going to go with that. It could have been baby Shobab, the little rebellious apostate. All right? Not the kid, but uh, David naming the kid that. Okay, he was the first kid that died. All right? The second kid that ends up dying is Amnon. And Amnon was David's firstborn. Okay? Amnon was David's firstborn. You remember, he gets killed by Absalom for what he did to Tamar. All right? And then the third kid that ends up dying is Absalom. Okay? And uh, he ends up getting killed in battle after he tries to usurp the throne. So we have three kids killed, but the question is, who is the fourth? And that's an interesting question when you think about it from the Bible. And there's a few options that we could uh, go with. Uh, one of them might be Adonijah. Okay, Adonijah. Now, he was a direct son of David. Uh, he was killed by Solomon for requesting to marry Abishag. You remember that story? Abishag is Miss Universe. David has died. He wants to marry Miss Universe. Solomon already had his eye on Miss Universe, and so he gets jealous and kills him. Okay? Uh, the problem with that, the problem with making this fourth kid uh, Adonijah, is that he died after David died. And the indication in the judgment is that you did this thing, so you yourself are going to experience a fourfold punishment for what you did. David wasn't around when Adonijah died. So maybe, maybe the fourth one's Adonijah, maybe not. Another option is that maybe this fourth guy is a Mesa. Now, if you have a Ruckman reference Bible, that's what Dr. Ruckman has in that note, is that the kid is a Mesa, and a Mesa is a nephew of David. He ends up getting killed uh, by Joab. You remember that story? His sword falls out, and Joab says, hey, how you doing? And kills him and leaves him in the dirt. Uh, that was a Mesa, all right? And uh, sometimes in the Bible, extended family can be counted as direct relatives. Um, but 
you know, honestly, having a Mesa listed as number four, uh, I don't. I don't personally think that's that good of a fit. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I, I just, it doesn't seem to fit very well. Here's another option. It could be his daughter Tamar. Now that's kind of an interesting one. Turn to uh, 1 Samuel 13 and Deuteronomy 22. All right. Now Tamar wasn't killed, but she was uh, forced. I'll try to be discreet. And in 2 Samuel chapter 13, in Deuteronomy 22, look at what the Bible has to say about this. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 20, that being forced is not technically murder, but it's akin to it. And in uh, 13 verse 20, he says, And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? Now you know the story, you know what Amnon did to her and how that all happened. He says, But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. All right. So Tamar, this girl, she lives and dies having had no children. Children are the desire of women in the Bible. And obviously she could have had children if she had ended up getting married. So why didn't she? She's a young woman. She's super attractive, the Bible says. Why didn't she end up getting married? Just living her life in spite of what had happened to her. All right. Well, there's something odd here where it almost looks like she gets overcome with depression or something and she never got over it. And uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a real thing. That's a, just a label that's slapped on it. But it is a real thing that happens to people. And uh, some people get it worse than others. And uh, this awful thing essentially ended Tamar's life as she knew it. Uh, Amnon essentially murdered her spirit, if you will. She, she never recovered from this. She never married, and she never had children. And seeing as how this girl died with no children, how is that any different than if she had been murdered? It's an interesting thing to think about. Tamar ended up being cut off with no survivors. It's just that her cutting off wasn't sudden like these other three. It, her cutting off was just kind of took a little bit longer. Now, there's something spiritually damaging about this particular sin that happens to women. And if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 22, look at what the Bible says in verse 25. All right. It says, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. That's what God has to say about it. And God elevates this, that sin to the level of murder. So that's interesting. Now, granted, some women overcome it and they move on and they live happy lives. And uh, people that are, that are in those situations that match that description, you might liken them to someone who was attempted, attempt, attempted murder. You know, the guy gets jumped out and shot up and, you know, he's laying there and bleeding out, but, you know, he survives, you know, he's a survivor. He, he has scarring for the rest of his life, but, you know, he, he lives. Um, sometimes people reco physically recover from attempted murder. And sometimes women recover spiritually and emotionally and mentally after being forced and experiencing something like that. But generally there's major damage and in the case and in many cases like in the case of Tamar some people are just so overwhelmed that they end up either killing themselves or their whole entire life is ruined after that now uh, Craig Sawyer is an ex-navy seal who had a daughter a teenager who was taken at night and dragged into an alley and uh, forced and you can only imagine uh, the trauma that that would cause for not only his daughter but also for himself and for his wife and as far as I know, I think that's their only child. And uh, ultimately, Craig Sawyer and his daughter, and they're professing Christians, by the way, uh, they chose to take this situation and do something to prevent it from happening to someone else. And he and his daughter ended up founding uh, an organization called Vets for Child Rescue and have made it their mission in life to stop child trafficking and to get child traffickers behind bars and thus protect children from 
uh, these predators. Now, they've been hugely successful in what they're doing, and I encourage you to watch their story and uh, the undercover stings that they do. You can watch it on a documentary called Contraland. I wholeheartedly recommend that for every single Christian because that'll open up your eyes to some things if you're not already aware of some of this stuff. But uh, they tell their story and what happened and how that organization came to be and uh, some of the progress that they're making. And it's amazing how many predators and traffickers are in this community right around us right now within a hundred mile radius. Now, uh, thank God uh, that's how her story ended. She ended up becoming empowered, you know, and that's not always a bad thing. It's not always a feminist thing. But the fact of the matter is she overcame a major adversity in her life, and now she's empowered to try to put some criminals behind bars. Thank God for that. Uh, you know, uh, that's how their story ended, albeit he did mention that ever since this thing had happened to his daughter, uh, she wakes up at night terrified and sees shadowy figures in her room. So there's a lot of detrimental effects even when people recover from these type of, th type of things. Now, uh, Tamar's story didn't end like that. She was damaged for life, and for all practical purposes, her spirit, her personality, her will to live died when Amnon did what he did to her. So she might be number four, and I think that's a pretty good fit, but there's something about it because it's not an actual death, it, uh, it doesn't quite fit. So she might be number four, but there's actually another that could be number four also. There's actually a fourth son who had to suffer and die for David's sin. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. You find this person in the book of Matthew chapter 1. There's a fourth son of David that had to die for what David did. And in Matthew chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and what's interesting is this fourth son, if you were to make this fourth son Jesus, okay, uh, what you have is uh, you have Jesus Christ called the son of David throughout the Gospels, and technically he's a great, 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 great grandson. But uh, the Bible says in Romans 3.25 that his death was not only to save future sinners and forgive their sins, but his death on the cross was also, quote, to declare his righteousness, Jesus Christ's righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past, as in Old Testament, through the forbearance of God. Okay, so in other words, God in his forbearance in the Old Testament spared repentant people like David, uh, but those Old Testament saints were still sinners and they needed to have their sins remitted. Okay, and that means taken away, cleared. Jesus Christ suffered the punishment for their sins too, and when he did on the cross, he exchanged those Old Testament saints' sins for his righteousness. Okay? That's what happens to us at salvation, but that also is what happened to those Old Testament saints at the Calvary. All right? So that's why when those Old Testament saints were in paradise in the heart of the earth, okay, when Jesus died on the cross, they got the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, put on their account, their, sin, their sins exchanged for Christ's righteousness, and therefore, legally, they don't need to be held under the heart of the earth anymore. They have just as much legal right to exit their as Jesus did. And that's how that worked. So after Calvary, they were legally, technically, just as righteous as Christ was, and just as worthy to exit the heart of the earth and ascend to heaven where Jesus is today. Now, God put away David's sin back in 2 Samuel 12, but he had to deal with it in Matthew 27. You see how that works. God said, I'll put it away. And remember that David said, as the Lord liveth, the man's going to restore fourfold. So the Lord says, okay. Well, that means I guess I'm going to have to die. <laughs> Either I'm going to die or you're going to die, David, because you just swore by my name. So the Lord says, I'll go ahead and take it for you. And he put away his sin, and then later on he, he really put it away by uh, paying for it. All right, so that's interesting. A little interesting side note there. Now let's start uh, going over Ahithophel. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. Now, I've hinted over the last few weeks that there was someone in David's kingdom who was related to Bathsheba who evidently never got over what David did to her and to his family. And I'm referring to Ahithophel, David's genius counselor. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 16. Now, Ahithophel, he wasn't a prophet, okay? 
He, he didn't have magical powers, you know, he wasn't a wizard or anything like that. But he was extremely intelligent, and he was a brilliant strategist. And I don't know, maybe this guy had an IQ higher than Einstein or something like that. But in 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, look at what it says. It says, And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. You say, what's that? That's that breastplate with the Urim and the Thummim and those 12 little stones. And basically, if a man wanted to find out, what is God's will for my life? You could go up and ask the priest. The thing would start flashing, and uh, you would get the message. Either the priest would speak to you, probably, and uh, tell you what the will of God was in a particular situation. So it was always correct. Okay, Um, So uh, interesting thing with that. We won't go into all that. But he says that's what his counsel was like. And he says, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So his advice, his advice, Ahithophel's advice, was not necessarily righteous or necessarily according to the will of God. I'll explain that in a minute. But when it came to accomplishing a task, Ahithophel's advice was perfect. It was flawless. Like there was no better advice in the kingdom. Now look at how Ahithophel fits in this whole story. Look at 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 23. All right, 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 23. I'm going to try to help put these pieces together here. Okay, 2 Samuel 11. And look at Ahithophel here, in, or actually we're going to see how he fits. 2 Samuel 11, verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. Okay, this is when he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? All right, so she's the daughter of Eliam. Now let's look at him in 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23, this is the the mighty men of David. And in verse 34, okay, Eliphalet, the son of Asabai, the son of the Maacathite. Then you have Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. All right, do you see that? So you have uh, Ahithophel. And his son is Eliam, and Eliam's daughter is Bathsheba. So, that makes Ahithophel Bathsheba's grandpa. Okay? Now, when Nathan exposed David, Ahithophel being the counselor, the advisor of David, he was undoubtedly right there, (laughs) watching this whole thing unfold. And uh, maybe he already knew that David had done what he did. Maybe he already knew that because he was super smart. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Either way, he understood that David was responsible for committing adultery with his granddaughter, okay? Murdering his grandson-in-law at Rabbah, possibly responsible for the death of his son Eliam, as we've talked about in the past, but certainly causing the death of his first and only great-grandchild. Now, if you're a grandparent... That's going to make you mad. <laughs> okay. Now, you don't read about Ahithophel's reaction in any of this story, but it's interesting. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. Okay. We're going to, like I said, these are hidden details in the life of David. You kind of read between the lines and piece things together and ask questions. Why is this? Why is that? And it's interesting what you come out with. You don't read about Ahithophel's reaction during that time when Nathan is rebuking David, but it is interesting that years later, when Absalom is secretly conspiring to take the uh, kingdom, Ahithophel is the first political figure that Absalom goes to to get on his side. The first guy. Look at 2 Samuel 15, verse 10. All right? But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet... Then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And, when, and with Absalom went two hundred men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Okay, so he gets Ahithophel on his side. Now, you know what happens. David ends up fleeing into the wilderness with his household. Absalom takes the throne. And as soon as Absalom has sat down and established his power as king, Ahithophel volunteers to go out and kill David himself. Why would he do that? Look at 2 Samuel 17. 
2 Samuel 17, look at verse 1. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. He says, I'll lead the army. I'm not even a military guy, and I'll lead the army. <laughs> and he says in verse 2, And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee. And I will smite the king only, and I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all return, so all the people shall be in peace. He says, I will kill David myself. Wow, that's quite a thing. Real quick, notice in that text the five I will statements by Ahithophel. I will arise and pursue after David this night. I will come upon him. I will make him afraid. I will smite the king only, and I will bring back all the people. Now that's interesting, and that's significant, because Lucifer has five I will statements in Isaiah 14, and the connection indicates that Ahithophel, even though he's very smart, he is being led of the devil right here. All right, And what he is doing is not justified, even though he thinks he is perfectly justified in what he is doing. David did all this to me, so I'm going to do all this to him. But he's not just. All right. The only explanation for Ahithophel's hatred of David, okay, because you don't read about anything in the story of why would Ahithophel do this? There's no explanation unless you connect the dots to what David did to Ahithophel's family years before. Ahithophel is not right, though. David has, a, and the reason why Ahithophel is not justified and he's not right in what he's doing is because David has admitted his sin. David has repented, and David has sought forgiveness. And God has forgive, forgave and put away David's sin, albeit it's not clear, okay? So, but Ahithophel's responsibility is to forgive David also. That's his responsibility. Why? Because David repented, okay? When a person repents, the responsibility for the other person, the offended party, is to forgive when a person repents. The Bible says in Colossians 3.13... And a lot of times this verse is used in completely the wrong way. But Colossians 3.13 says, Forbearing one, other, one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, usually that's preached. That's a blanket statement. As a Christian, you're just supposed to forgive everybody. But the thing is, when did Christ forgive you? Christ forgave you when you repented. When you asked for his forgiveness, right? Okay. Christ's forgiveness is not arbitrary. It is conditional upon repentance, upon a person asking for forgiveness. If that was not true, then that would mean that every person born on the planet is already forgiven by God. But we know that's not true. That's why we go out and preach the gospel. <laughs> Because not everybody's forgiven. Most of these people in this town are not forgiven. Why? Because Jesus just doesn't want to forgive anybody? No. It's because they haven't asked. That's the condition. If Jesus Christ... For, you say, well, that's a work. No, it's not. It's not. Repentance is not a work. Okay, I'm not talking about turning over a new leaf. I'm talking about changing, admitting you're wrong... Admitting you're a sinner, admitting you're on the way to hell, and asking Jesus Christ to save you. Now, if Jesus Christ forgave all your sin when you simply confessed your sin and asked for forgiveness, okay? Then you ought to do the same when someone sins against you but admits their fault and asks you for forgiveness. As Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And if the person doesn't repent, then you're not obligated to forgive. You give it to God, you give vengeance to the Lord, okay? That's called binding and loosing. That's uh, called uh, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That's what that's talking about. And uh, you hold on to a thing, it's going to show up at the judgment seat. That's just how those things go. All right? doesn't mean that you're going to get in trouble. It just means, okay, if, if the guy doesn't repent and this thing is retained, okay, we're just going to show up at the judgment and Christ will deal with it then. You know, like a trial. It, if, like I said, I've said it before and I'll say it again. When you look at the Bible from the standpoint of a courtroom and a judge, so much of it starts to make perfect sense. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's see. Forgiving someone can be difficult sometimes, but it is the right thing to do. And the retribution is to be left to the Lord. Um, 
Ahithophel is understandably angry. But David has repented, sure, but that doesn't bring his great-grandchild back. Okay, right? Uh, Ahithophel, you can under, if you put yourself in Ahithophel's shoes, yeah, you're going to be f really frustrated. You know, ah, he repented. So there's a part of you that thinks, man, it's not fair. So God's put away his sin after all he did. But you have to remember that, uh, you know, yes, his sin has been put away, but David is going to suffer the consequences for what he did. And the, he, Ahithophel needs to take solace in the fact that the judge of all the earth will do right. It'll be fine. Ahithophel should give vengeance to God and trust God with that and have faith that God will deal with this. David is going to reap the consequences of his sin, but rather than letting God execute the proper payback, okay, Ahithophel, he's been for years thinking about this, and when the, when the opportunity came up, he took matters into his own hands to try to get payback to David. Okay? All right, now let's take a look at Absalom and his mother, Maacah. Now he's one of the major, Absalom is one of the major 18 types of Antichrist in the Bible. Uh, his name, Absalom, means father of peace. Okay? Absalom, Absalom, father of peace. And his means of obtaining what Absalom would call peace... <laughs> You know, his means of obtaining peace is by lying to people to get them on his side, creating discontentment in society by making people think they're oppressed, and destroying personal property to make a point. He burns down Joab's field. Remember that? That's what uh, Absalom does. Absalom, the son of David. Right here. Okay. Absalom fits the MO of a change agent, or what you would call today a Black Lives Matter protester or Antifa, okay, or a social justice warrior. That's Absalom. Uh, he burns down a field to make a point. Have you noticed how quick the news media has squashed the idea that BLM might be behind some of these uh, insane forest fires? I saw that Portland, like two days ago, had like literally the worst air quality index in the world for like a day or two in a row uh, because of all this smoke. And uh, people are not even willing to entertain the possibility that maybe some of these people that have stated they want to destroy our society might have started some of these fires. There's a handful of police officers and firefighters that have made such statements, and all of a sudden they're fired. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even, and they're making these statements to say, well, that's just irresponsible. They shouldn't be saying things like that until it can be proven. Hey, stupid, they've been doing their job for years. They know what they're talking about. And they know, given the job that they have, they're not just going to make a statement off the cuff or make some quick rash judgment. Somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about might do that, but somebody who's been in that profession for years knows what they're looking at. They know that all these fires don't just start up all of a sudden. So we got some Absaloms running around Portland these days. And uh, may God uh, do to them what God did to Absalom. Amen. Now, Absalom was David's uh, third child and was uh, born while uh, he was king in Hebron. Okay, 2 Samuel 3. We've got to start a little bit late, so we're going to go a little bit late. Hope uh, that'll be all right with everybody. 2 Samuel chapter 3, because I do have some interesting stuff here for you. I know it's a little bit long for the kids, but we'll, I'll try to get through it quickly. Absalom was David's third child, and he was born while he was king in Hebron, king over Judah. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. It says, And unto David were sons born in Hebron. And his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitis. And his second, Kiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Okay? So Absalom's mother was Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. You say, well, What is that? Well, Geshur was up in Syria in northeast Bashan. That's beyond the, the kingdom of, the, of Ephraim, the half-tribe of Manasseh and Reuben. Okay? This is a Gentile kingdom. Uh, Maacah is the first and only Gentile, at least that we have on record, first and only Gentile woman that David marries. And I find that interesting. Which means that Absalom has Jewish and Syrian blood in him. Now, you say, why did David marry this woman? 
Well, back in those days, you know, it was normal for kings to marry the daughters of other kings, okay? And this was a means of securing peace between kingdoms. And the reason why you do that is if one king marries the daughter of another king, now these two kingdoms don't want to fight each other because they have vested interests in each other, okay? And even though it was a common thing and all the cool kings were doing it, uh, that doesn't mean that it was right or that it was a good idea, <laughs> okay? Now, when it comes to marriages, God's primary will is one man for one woman, and each Jew was actually supposed to marry a Jew from their own tribe, according to Numbers 36, 7. And uh, the Jews were not to marry the Gentiles, according to Deuteronomy 7, 3. That high ideal of God didn't last very long, <laughs> okay? Um, bear in mind that in the Old Testament, the Lord stated that what His perfect will was, if you will, but because no one could be born again, nobody had a new nature in the Old Testament, God was indeed very merciful, very gracious, and He did allow some latitude, in, uh, especially in marital matters, because as Jesus said, because of the hardness of men's hearts, okay? So, for example, God hates divorce, right? God hates it, but he still allowed certain uh, allowances for divorce under certain conditions uh, in the Old Testament and in the New. Now, God allowed his servants some leeway in the area of marriages. Nevertheless, it didn't change the fact that marriage comes with trouble in the flesh. That's not just a New Testament thing. That's always been the case. Jacob, uh, a perfect, well, let me say this, a perfect marriage between a Christian woman and one Christian man is still going to have trouble in the flesh, right? Two born-again people with the Holy Spirit in them. Uh, Jacob, he married two women. And God didn't strike him dead when he did that, but he certainly had double trouble in the flesh. <laughs> and uh, Abraham, he had children with Hagar. And when he did that, God didn't strike him dead, but he had a lot of trouble in the flesh because of it. And same with Moses. He married Zipporah, the Ethiopian. And same with David marrying Maacah. All right. Now, Maacah is his first and only Gentile wife. And he gives, she gives birth to a son that is going to be Saul 2.0. I mean, talk about trouble in the flesh, <laughs> okay? And by the way, meaka, interestingly enough, means oppression. Oppression. I'm guessing that she wasn't very pleasant to live with, <laughs> you know, just based on her name. David was married to Ahinoam and Abigail while in the wilderness. So meaka is the first woman he marries after becoming king of Judah, which makes me wonder if David might have been maybe prodded or pushed into this marriage. You say, because they might have said, oh, David, you know, you need to marry this woman. That's what kings do. You're a king now. You need to marry this woman. Yeah, but she's a Gentile, and I'm not even attracted to her. She's oppressive. I, you know, that, no, David, you need to marry this woman. That's what kings do. You want peace with Syria, don't you? If you don't marry her, Talmai, the king of Geshur, is going to be greatly offended. And so he marries Miss Oppression. I'm guessing, I'm just guessing, probably not out of love, but she end, and she maybe ends up being a nightmare. I mean, her name means oppression. If I, I mean, it's like, hello, my name is Matt. What's your name? Oppression. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> what do they say? Swipe left, swipe right. I don't know. I don't know how any of that stuff works. <laughs> That's probably a bad reference. I don't even know. But uh, moving on. All right, so he should have moved on from Maica, but he doesn't. Maybe she was a nightmare. I don't know. But, uh, you know, fun fact, fun fact, the word nightmare is from a word in the 1300s that referred to a female evil spirit that afflicted men in their sleep with a feeling of suffocation. Uh, in other words, it's a reference to the same phenomena that people report today experiencing a dark entity sitting on their chest at night, except in modern times it's called a old hag syndrome or it's called night terrors, or it's called sleep paralysis by the uh, materialistic psychologists. But it was called a nightmare for hundreds of years. It wasn't just a dream thing. It was when you see shadows in your room and they do things. Um, mare, the word mare, uh, means monster, incubus, or goblin in Old English, Old Norse, Middle Dutch, and Old High German. That's what that word means. So a nightmare is literally a night goblin or a night demon or a night gray alien or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you can call it a nightmare if you want. <laughs> That's kind of what Maica was, sort of like that. So David marries Maica, and when they have a kid, David names him Father of Peace, as in the bestower, the progenitor, the originator of peace. 
and uh, maybe it was a peace between Syria and Judah. I don't know. Maybe uh, Maica was awful to live with until she finally had a baby, and then she left him alone, and David finally had some peace. I don't know. But uh, we don't know exactly when, when David married Princess Maica, but we do have a few clues, and I want to show you a couple more things here. Um, let's see. Uh, number one, there's no way possible. So I've got David in the wilderness right here. He marries Ahinoam and Abigail in the wilderness. There's no way in the world that he married Maacah while he was in the wilderness. If you're, if you're the king of Geshur, if you're one of the kings of Syria, you don't marry your princess daughter off to some Robin Hood running around in the wilderness. Okay, <laughs> You don't do that. There's no way. There's no record of it anyway in the Bible. And uh, David, when he's in the wilderness, he has nothing to do with the Syrians up in Bashan. So uh, as I said, Maacah must have been the first woman that he married after becoming king of Judah. He must have married her in there somewhere. All right. And number two, Absalom, what that means is Absalom was born after David became king of Judah, but before he became king of Israel. Remember that there is a seven year time period right there from Judah to Israel, and he has Absalom during that time. Now that David is royalty, okay, it would be acceptable for the king of Geshur to marry his daughter off to David. All right. And there's a seven. So there's a seven year time period. He gets married to Maacah after he becomes king of Judah. Now there's a seven year time period where Absalom's born. He's not born after he becomes king of Israel. He's born while David is king in Hebron. And that's important. All right. Now, we don't know 100 percent for sure. And I'm just being honest with this stuff. I'm not just trying to grab straws, but I'm just being upfront. We don't know 100 percent for sure what year Absalom was born. But with the clues that we do have, we can be reasonably close as to when he was born. Now, we know from 2 Samuel 3, 2 through 5 that David had six sons while he was king in Hebron. While he was king for that seven years, he had six sons. Maybe he had them each consecutive year, or maybe he had them in all, all one year with all these different women. We don't know. But we do know that Absalom was the third child. And we do know that Absalom is a type of the Antichrist, right? So I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm just going to stick Absalom's birth in the middle of these seven years. Three and a half years into his kingdom, Absalom comes along. Now, that's certainly possible. It can't necessarily be disproven. Okay? Can't prove it, can't disprove it. But if I am correct with that, and that's the date of Absalom's birth, I'm going to go with red for Absalom. If this is the date for Absalom's birth, three and a half years into his king, kingship of Judah, then you have this. You have the Antichrist coming to life. Well, number one, you have a fact in the tribulation. The Antichrist comes to life in the midst of Daniel's 70th week. That's interesting. In the middle of seven years, the Antichrist is raised from the dead. So I have Absalom coming to life in the middle of the seven years to match the type. Number two, what's really interesting about this is if that's true, that would put David at age 33 in the middle of the week. Okay. When Absalom was born and David is a type of Jesus Christ. Now, how old was Jesus Christ in the middle of Daniel's 70th week? 33. If you go with the uh, theory that Jesus' baptism marked the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, which I do. I subscribe to that theory. So the first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week was the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. And, <clears throat> and when Jesus was cut off, he was 33 years old. Now, Jesus is crucified and risen again in the midst of Daniel's 70th week at age 33. And then God paused the clock. And 1,997 years later, the midst of the 70th week resumes when the Antichrist rises from the dead as Satan incarnate. And then you have the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. All right. So the types would match if you have Absalom born right there. Now, consider this strange statement in 2 Samuel 15. 2 Samuel 15. Everybody still okay? Yes. All right. 2 Samuel 15. I don't mean to keep you too long, but 2 Samuel 15, verse 7. I want to get through this part here. When Absalom is about to launch his coup, it says, And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. Now, this is when he's starting the machinations of his coup. This is when it's beginning. He's about to to do all this stuff. It says, 
after 40 years, Absalom said to the king. Now, after 40 years, okay, you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that he's 40 years old? Is this after 40 years after Absalom's birth? Well, that can't be possible. Because if this is 40 years, if Absalom is 40 years old, you take 33 plus 40, that puts you at 73. David would be dead by then. So that cannot be Absalom being 40 years old. So uh, you say, well, what is it? Well, let me just point this out real quick. Some new Bibles change this to after four years. Okay? They change it to after four years, and they claim that it was a scribal error or other, some stupid thing like that. And uh, usually, if it isn't changed in the new Bibles, they cast doubt on the scriptures uh, by inserting a footnote that says that some of the ancient manuscripts say four years. Basically, the idea is, well, the King James got it, translators got it wrong after 40 years, because they say, well, it can't possibly be after 40 years, because that would put you after the death of David. Well, uh, 40 years is actually correct, and if these idiotic Bible correctors, the scholars, would try to study their Bible instead of changing their Bible all the time, they might actually learn something. After 40 years must be referring to some particular event that had happened 40 years prior. Now, looking at our timeline, we know that this coup by Absalom took place after Solomon's birth. Okay, we have Solomon's birth here, and in the story, this all happens after Solomon's birth. Okay, and it obviously takes place before David's death, because David is alive when this coup happens. So it took place in the last 18 years of David's life. At some point in here is when Absalom rebelled. Now that's important. If we subtract uh, 40 years from the dates that we do know, we know age 52 is when Solomon was born. We know age 70 is when he died. If we subtract 40 years and try to find out what this after 40 years could be referring to, that puts you at 12 years old. That puts you at 12 years old. Okay? And that also puts you 40 years, uh, would put you at 30 years old. Okay? Right? So... The 40 years has to be referring to after 40 years, something that happened right in this time period right here. Okay, now that's important. Follow me here. There's only three major events that we know of that happened during that time. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but that's all right. Uh, there's only three major events that happened during that time. Number one, you have uh, David's anointing and the killing of Goliath, and you have that in the uh, Dr. Ruckman's reference Bible, he, he says that the after 40 years is referring to the uh, anointing of David. That's a possibility, but there are some other possibilities we'll look at. Um, the killing of Goliath and the anointing of David both happened right around the same year. So, after 40 years might be referring to 40 years after the killing of Goliath or the anointing of David. Number two, it could be referring to 40 years after David's exile, which would have uh, been right here. And like I said, my theory on that is that David's exile was three and a half years. Ah, these markers are killing me this morning. All right. My theory, you remember a couple of weeks ago, was that three and a half years he was running from the face of Saul. That would put him at age 26. Okay. It could be refer referring to that. <clears throat> Number three, it could, the other possibility is it's 40 years after David became king of Judah. Real quick, I know this is tedious, but I just want to point this out because I have to be thorough here. So you know that I'm not pulling something out of midair. No, option number three won't work. 40 years after David became king of Judah. Obviously, if it's 40 years after he became king of Judah, that would mean that the insurrection of Absalom happened in his 70th year of his reign, and that happened the same year that he died. But you have David so weak that he has to have some girl keep him warm and you know at night and... He can't keep himself warm, so he's not going to be running around in the forest sleeping in holes while Absalom is coming after him. So that means the Absalom's rebellion could not have happened on the 70th year, and it's not a reference 40 years after he became king of Judah. That's impossible. All right. Uh, option number two or option number one might work. Option number one, if it's 40 years after he became king of Ju or I mean, 40 years after he was anointed by Samuel, or 40 years after he killed Goliath, that would mean, okay, if that's the case, and that might be, you add 40 years, and that puts you at age 56. 
Okay, right? 16 plus 40 is 56. That would mean that David was 56 years old when Absalom rebelled, and that would mean there'd be another 14 years until David died, if you go with that theory. Now, the third option, if we said, well, it was 40 years after David fled into the wilderness, and my theory was that it was three and a half years before he was king of Judah, so that puts you around 26 years old. If you go with that, 26 plus 40 is what? Israel? Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that would put David at age 66 when Absalom rebelled. Okay. And what's interesting about that is David would be age... I'm going to make David blue. David would be age 66 when he rebelled. And if Absalom was born right here, that would make Absalom, the type of the Antichrist, exactly 33 years old when he rebelled. Interesting. And then once that whole thing was over, David would live for four more years and die. Roughly four years. Now, seeing that David, it, it says, uh, I personally think that this, this option with uh, 40 years after David fleeing in the wilderness is correct, because it says after 40 years, and it begs the question, 40 years after what? Well, what is about to happen? David is about to flee into the wilderness from the face of a type of the Antichrist. Exactly 40 years prior, he fled into the wilderness from the face of a type of the Antichrist. Those two things go together. Furthermore, the, only, the other thing that seems to validate that theory that I have there is that after Solomon's death in 2 Samuel 21... You read about the story of Absalom and some of the fallout of all that happened. You read in chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. And he says it's because of the Gibeonites and Saul killing the Gibeonites. Now, you have this story of a three-year famine. Now, I, I, I understand that a couple weeks ago I said that this was probably an appendix story. You don't really know where it goes in the life of David. Because um, there's a couple other appendix stories there, too. But the fact that, you know, and as I study this a little bit more, it says, after the story of Absalom, it says, then there was a famine. <laughs> so that gives you the chronology. That's consecutive. So what it's telling you is after this whole thing of Absalom, Absalom's rebellion, you have Absalom's rebellion, that ends three years, and then David's death. And that fits. That fits what you have there in 2 Samuel 21, because what you read after that is the death of David and Solomon taking the throne. All right? So it says that there's a three-year-long famine. It's not five years. It's not two years. It's not eight years. It's three years. Now, if you have Absalom's rebellion, so, and then three years later, and then David's death, that's the order of that story. I'm wrapping up here. I'm serious, I only have this much. <laughs> All right, so this is the climax of this. This is what I want you to get. And this is kind of more Bible study, not a lot of preaching this morning, but... What you have, if that's correct, you have David at age 70 when he died. You have David at age 66 when the rebellion happened. David and Maacah have baby Absalom when David was age 33. Absalom would then be 33 when he rebelled. Forty years prior to Absalom's rebellion and David's exile there, you would have David's exile here. And if these dates are correct, David is age 66, right around there. Forty years prior gives you 26, correct? 26. We know that he was age 30 when he took the throne of Judah. And what that tells you is... The 40 after 40 years is the clue in the Bible that reveals how old David was when he fled from Saul. Because you're not told this in the story. You're not told in those chapters of, of David fleeing from Saul how long that took. You don't know how old David was. You don't know how long he was in the wilderness. All you know is that he was around 16 when he killed Goliath and he was 30 when he took the throne. You're not told all these details. But by getting later pieces of the story, after 40 years, that real uh, strange statement, 
it tells you that David was 26 when he fled from Saul. That gives you four years from here to when he took the throne. And knowing the God of the Bible, I bet you, I would bet my mortgage. <laughs> Not that I have, I don't technically, I'm a renter technically, but I would bet a lot of money. Knowing God, that thing, that wilderness fleeing from the face of Saul was exactly three and a half years to match the tribulation. Because we're not told what months all this stuff was. So it doesn't have to be exactly 40 years. It's just around 26, around 27, around 66, around 67. Now, uh, that's uh, so before when I told you that I thought that David's flight into the wilderness was three and a half years. It was speculation before. But now I think I can prove it. Now I think I have absolute proof. There's incontrovertible fact that that was three and a half years. Maybe it was three years and 3.75 years, maybe it was four years, maybe it was 3.25 years. It's probably three, point, three and a half years. So I found that really interesting. Um, so basically what you have there is you have great types of prophecy given in the scriptures, all hidden in there. But it's all the little hidden details in order to get that stuff. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll wrap up. Thank you, Father, for your word. Please uh, bless the results from today's study. I pray, God, that people would marvel at your word and get something from this and just have a renewed interest in the scriptures. And I just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.